In the last decade, shonen manga and anime have greatly matured from their teenage power fantasy roots. Sure, they still have a hearty amount of battle shonen geared towards boys, but many of those titles are offering a newfound complexity. From Attack on Titan to Demon Slayer, Promise Neverland, My Hero Academia, and now Jujutsu Kaisen, we're seeing modern shonen being taken to grand new heights, and not just in terms of popularity. <laughs> You serious? Many of the shows I've listed have taken the traditional elements that make up a shonen, specifically their setups, story arcs, and character archetypes, and have created unique storytelling experiences by both streamlining and subverting the formulas that made them. Even though there's no such thing as the perfect story, there is such a thing as making the perfect decisions for your story that maximize its potential for greater emotional impact and entertainment value. In today's video, I want to explore how the smash hit Jujutsu Kaisen attempts to perfect the shonen formula and why it succeeds in spades. So strap yourselves in, I'm Daniel and this is Jujutsu Kaisen, the next evolution of shonen. Okay. So stop me if you've heard this one before. A naive young man discovers a dangerous new world and attends a school dedicated to fighting evil, while at the same time he wrestles with his newfound power that comes in the form of a spirit that threatens to destroy the world. I know, it's not the most original premise in the world, but honestly, there's a good reason for it, and the manga's creator uses it to his advantage. But before we can analyze Jujutsu Kaisen itself, we first have to understand its creator, Guga Akutami. Akutami-san is a very private person, so I won't be writing up some in-depth dossier about his life and childhood, none of that stuff. However, the most important aspect I want to bring up is his age. At the time of recording this, Akutami-san is only 28 years old, which is insanely young, especially when you consider the fact that he was first published in Jump Next in 2014, and then officially published a 47-page one-shot in Weekly Shonen Jump in 2015. So he did all of this between the ages of 22 and 23 years old. And by the way, I'm 23 years old right now as I'm recording this. Oh dear God, I'm 23 years old? What, where did all the time go? What am I doing with my life? What, what, what did I ever accomplish? What will I accomplish? Oh my God. The reason I bring all of this up is because Akutami-san is a cool young cat who wears his influences on his sleeve. In his first ever TV interview, Akutami-san said that he was in the fourth grade when he first read Bleach, and it went on to become his favorite manga of all time. He also stated that Jujutsu Kaisen's protagonist has his clothing inspired by Naruto. These basic inspirations are evident in his work, however, they also work in his favor to subvert our expectations from its story and characters. A good example of this is in the character Megumi Fushigi. Akutami-san's inspiration for the design came from Sasuke and Kageyama. He wanted to invoke the imagery of the familiar shonen rival character, however he purposely made sure not to go down the same path. Instead, he opted for Fushigiro and the protagonist to become friends and close teammates. In his TV interview, Akutami-san stated that he found the rivalry angle to be kind of boring, and recognized the writing opportunities in allowing the two characters to have a unique, non-combative relationship. Openly paying homage to the influential works of those who've come before can make for an accessible reading slash viewing experience, and accessibility is not inherently a bad thing. Just because an anime or a manga like My Hero, Demon Slayer, or Jujutsu Kaisen make its initial entry into its worlds and characters very easy to recognize or get into, doesn't mean it lacks depth or nuance. Nor does it mean that it lacks the opportunity to surprise the audience and create genuine emotional investment on top of its inherent entertainment value. Today's top authors fully recognize what they and so many others love about the shonen genre and are able to utilize this to their advantage in their storytelling. When done right, this allows them genuine creative freedom by warping the confines of what makes up a traditional shonen into a springboard for new avenues of narrative creativity. 
And now that we've got the proper background on its creator and influences, let's go into greater detail about what makes Jujutsu Kaisen so great. Now, before we continue, I just want to put out a proper disclaimer. For a majority of this video, I will be talking about the anime for Jujutsu Kaisen. There will be key comparisons to the manga when needed, but primarily focusing on the anime adaptation for this discussion will keep this video focused and concise. Also, I uh, plan on keeping the video as spoiled the free as I possibly can, and uh, I will timestamp any major spoilers so you can avoid them. However, imagery from episodes 1 to 17 will be present in this video. You have been warned, and I still highly recommend that you check out the show for yourself. With that being said, on with the show. Okay, so if I had to break down why Jujutsu Kaisen works for me, it has to be three main elements. Characters, world, and a sense of humor. First up, characters. Now, Jujutsu Kaisen features a diverse cast of memorable heroes and villains, so in order to keep things simple, we'll just stick to two characters from the show's main trio, Yuji Itadori and Nabara Kugasaki. You so precious when you smile. Uh, yeah. Oh, <coughs> excuse me, I have no clue how that got through editing. My, I'm so sorry, my bad. At the start of our story, our protagonist, Yuji Itadori, is your average high school student who happens to be cut like an H&M model with a 300 inch vertical leap, who also spends his time with his ailing grandfather after school when he's not hanging around the world's scariest book club. However, his life goes awry when his friends break open a cursed object that destroys the barrier between the human and the spirit world, unleashing a curse upon them. Oh, and I forgot to mention that all this happens on the same day that his grandpa dies, so yeah. Definitely not poggers. Then Ace Megumi, spirit detective, is sent on the case and explains to Itadori that the finger from the cursed object is actually a powerful relic of the demon king Ryum and Sukuna. And if any curses were to consume it, they'd gain unprecedented power. Oh, oh my, oh my god, no, 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 no. Oh my god, he just ate the finger. He just ate the finger, that is so unsanitary. This simple ideology ends up making for complex character dilemmas very early on in the story. Because of Itadori's intrinsic desire to help others, he refrains from taking a life. However, the story continues to increasingly put him in tougher moral dilemmas that push the boundaries of his idealism. What happens when he can't save someone? What creatures truly are alive by his definition? Or, my favorite question that the show proposes, how evil? does a person have to be for Itadori to contemplate killing them? Akutami-san stated in his TV interview that he wanted to be strict on Itadori in the writing process. Despite Itadori's stature as a passive protagonist in this tale, he wanted to continuously push him. This leads to his willingness to kill off any important or mainstay characters in the series as long as it makes the story more interesting. However, the cutthroat nature of Akutami's writing never impedes on Itadori staying true to who he is. What makes Itadori such an engaging protagonist is that he's just nice. Genuinely, he's just, just nice. He loves his friends, pop culture, self-improvement, and just, just wants to make the world a better place before he dies one day. His positivity is just infectious. This also makes it hurt even more when we see the world try to crush his spirit. Yuji Itadori may take great inspiration from past and contemporary shonen protagonists, however, he still stands on his own, as his own character, with a unique and interesting journey ahead of him. Also, because of the brilliant writing, we got this amazing scene. You're late, yeah. Satoru. <laughs> Eight minutes late. That old dude's making cute things? Principal Masamichi Yaga. This is the boy. Yuji Itadori! I'm into girls like Jennifer Lawrence! This is an honor. What are you here for? I cannot begin to explain to you how hard that joke made me laugh when I first watched the show, but please do not forget this joke <laughs> because we'll definitely be coming back to it soon. All right, up next we have... Okay, look, 
it's hard for me to hide my bias here, but Nabara Kugasaki is one of my favorite anime characters in recent memory. She's the perfect blend of playing off of and subverting a character trope. She has the, the brashness of Sakura and the snarky yandere attitude of Sinjurahara from Bakamonogatari, and yet she's rounded out with this sweet small town girl vibe like Ochako Uraraka from My Hero. Even though this whirlwind of character traits shouldn't blend well at all together on paper, it all flows together seamlessly thanks to some stellar writing and phenomenal voice acting. And the key reason for that is because Nobara's character quirks are not used as a substitution for a personality. Oftentimes in anime, female characters come off as one dimensional because writers only give them a single character trait and call that a personality. Then they're reduced to delivering whatever simple punchline they're designed for and used as objects to be objectified by other characters in the audience themselves. Characters like Nobara are so rare and refreshing to see in the shonen because she's not reduced to being the love interest or fan service material or just acts completely irrational all the time because women be crazy, am I right, fellow males? Nobara isn't perfect and she knows it, but she's self-confident and will never back down because she wants to achieve her dreams. She's just a small town girl living in a cursed field world and it goes on and on and on and like Itadori, she has this infectious love for life and those around her because she understands the fragility of life and she's worked hard to make it all the way to the big city to chase her dreams. The best encapsulation of who Nobara is can be best seen here. <laughs> This is who she is. Strong unafraid and full of life. She doesn't care what society's expectations are. She only cares about surpassing the ones that she set for herself. Nobara is a clear cut example of why Jujutsu Kaisen's characters work. However, the best written characters won't matter if you don't have somewhere interesting to put them in. So now it's time to talk about More and more over the years, a strong sense of nostalgia has gripped the anime community. There's this longing from fans of old school anime to return to a similar style or vibe of their favorite classics. And thanks to internet culture, this undying love for classics like Cowboy Bebop and Yu Yu Hakusho have become popularized into a full on trend. Now, literal anime aesthetics are a thing. The feeling of nostalgia and its subsequent romanticization by recent generations has led to this intangible feeling becoming well, real and monetizable. However, the underlying characteristic between all of these heavily aesthetic shows is that their strong sense of style is genuinely ingrained into the DNA of what those shows are. Cowboy Bebop and Samurai Champloo weren't trying to emulate a certain vibe. The creator of both shows, Sinichiro Watanabe, simply created a presentation that fit the themes and characters in their respective worlds. He understood that everything from music to sound design to art style and everything in between are what come to make a show truly memorable. It's about how it all fits together in service of the story. And in the case of something like Yu Yu Hakusho, its long lasting appeal is not only the show's quality, but the fact that it oozes 90s. The show unabashedly embraces the Japanese streetwear and pop culture of that era. The strong drip on all the characters turns their designs into somewhat of a time capsule, which only adds to the nostalgia. And make no mistake, Jujutsu Kaisen is aware of how important the presentation of the world is, especially in the anime. If the show reaches the heights of popularity that I truly think it's capable of, then I believe we'll see a similar love for the aesthetic that the show presents in the future. Fashion is always one of the best ways to connect with popular culture, and Jujutsu Kaisen uses it to its advantage. 
Even though characters can be found in similar school uniforms, Akutami-san implemented the bleach approach for character designs. Making the design simple helps reduce the workload for himself and subsequently Studio MAPPA's animators. However, this also allows for characters to express themselves through their clothing. Their choices in what they do and do not wear makes them stick out and allows their character designs to leave more of a lasting impression. And for the times that the characters are in street wear, it's normally fashionable and diverse attire. However, Studio MAPPA's biggest contribution in bringing Jujutsu Kaisen's world to life is through their stunning visuals and absolute banger of a soundtrack. Like, oh my god, why is this song so good? Oh no, wait, no, wait. That's the ending theme? Oh my god. Oh, it's such a banger. Why does it slap so hard? From rock to synth to hip hop to pop, if the kids are dancing and bopping to it, then it's in Jujutsu Kaisen. But I mean that in the best way possible. Studio Mappa is well aware of what slaps in the streets nowadays and uses it to connect more with their audiences. And where they have freedom to, they have fun with their interpretations of characters, and it shows in most of their themes. They actually put Easter eggs in them that twistedly foreshadow things to come, but also use them to set up and pay off anime original skits and jokes. And the reason I bring all of this up is not so I can ogle at the show and go, Oh wow, that, that's so hashtag relatable. I like clothes and music too. I mention all this because it's used to ground our characters in reality. Even when the show is at its most bombastic or horrifying, we never lose sense of who these characters are. They feel real because the world around them makes them feel familiar, thus making their failures and triumphs even more so. Catchy anime openings, trendy clothes, and pop culture references can easily be written off as a cheap joke or attempts at relatability, but in actuality, they're important backbones in us buying into the story. However, the elements that ground the world are only one aspect of what makes Jujutsu Kaisen's setting so engaging. The next element, it's the supernatural. Jujutsu Kaisen's take on the ghosts and ghouls that go bump in the night can send a serious chill down the spine. This show's curses often take on a Lovecraftian approach to horror. Based on the works of famed author and bigot H.B. Lovecraft, Lovecraftian horror puts extra emphasis on the fear of the unknown and a bit of bodily horror. Lovecraft believed the scariest things to the human mind are the things we can't see and it plays up the idea that there are unseen malevolent entities lurking behind an invisible veil that prey upon the unsuspecting mortals, causing unspeakable evil. Jujutsu Kaisen uses that idea to great effect in order to create some terrifically terrifying monsters and deliciously deplorable villains. Curses are shown as this ever-evolving force of nature that is only here for the purpose of causing harm to humanity, and by the time their victims are made aware of their existence, it's too late. Because of this, the show never loses a sense of danger and dread at the idea of what horrors lurk around the next corner. And because so much attention is given into exploring the more horrific elements of the show, the moments of levity have more impact and the show can truly shine when it's doing what it does best, and that's being a battle shonen. Through this system, we're able to create a clear line of tension between characters, which then in turn leads to a large amount of hype when characters find creative ways to break the rules. And Akutami-san intentionally designed the power system to be this way. He wanted to create something that had room for believably overpowered characters so that the status quo is always at risk of being shaken up. With characters this powerful, it forces the writing to be creative on how fights and overall plot lines pan out. And the best part about all of this is that the dynamic and horrifying world allows for some spectacular action sequences to play out.
Take away all the guts and glory and still what we're left with is a wonderful narrative with engaging characters. Jujutsu Kaisen always takes the moment seriously that it needs to. There's no question about that at all. However, the generally witty and reverent banter is an endless treat whilst watching the show. And the best part about all of it is that these punchlines are often actually getting paid off as moments of genuine character development. My favorite example of this is actually back at the Jennifer Lawrence joke I mentioned earlier. I found that joke initially hilarious because of one, how absurd it was for Itadori to introduce himself along with his taste of well-endowed women, and two, the reference sets a tone early on that the story doesn't mind some fourth wall breaking every now and again. However, the true genius of this joke and subsequent payoff comes in a later arc. This next part contains minor spoilers for a quick character interaction, so if you do not want to see this, then skip to the timestamp on the screen. It's not a big spoiler at all by any stretch of the imagination. Minor spoiler, but if you don't want to know it all, okay, skip to this part and I will see you there. Later on in the show, we're introduced to rival school student Aoi Toto. A buff giga chad of a human being with an unhealthy obsession with Japanese idols, his iconic character quirk is his burning desire to ask every single person he meets one simple question. <laughs> And if he does not like the answer, he will literally kick your teeth in. His over-the-top character and demeanor is a joy to behold, but has obvious potential for very easily becoming played out. The anime sidesteps this issue in favor of something far more interesting. Due to Itadori's raw strength, it was only inevitable that he would have to take on Toto and the rival school tournament arc. And when these two clash, something absolutely incredible happens. Yes. They actually turned a running joke about Jennifer Lawrence's butt into a genuine <laughs> subplot of character development for Itadori and Toto. I, I, over the course of this entire arc, they... <laughs> I think I stuck the pin over that. Three, two, one. Over the course of this entire arc, they work closely together and push each other to grow as individuals and fighters. It's absolutely incredible. And I can see this easily being written off as just a funny gag, but I truly believe the writing does not get the credit it deserves for this series. Comedy is so hard to pull off. It's especially hard to pull off in, in a nuanced way that still lands despite being translated to other languages. To me, this is truly something special and the comedy matters in this series in a way that I did not even expect. Now for this last part, I just want to say thank you to Gege Akutami for writing such an incredible manga. Thank you to Studio Mappa and their incredible, their amazing, phenomenal team of animators, directors, composers, voice actors. I, for both sub and dub, I just thank you. Also, thank you to the community surrounding Jujutsu Kaisen. Oftentimes in the anime community, the discussions surrounding the anime themselves just devolves into a shouting match about how the anime somebody else loves is trash or mid or whatever. And even more now, we're seeing negativity in this community escalate to the point of death threats and harassment towards creators, and that's completely unacceptable. Staff members at Studio Mappa had to private their social media accounts because of dangerous vitriol they received for their adaptation of Attack on Titan's final season. And it just truly saddens me. So many of us say how we want anime to become more inclusive to global audiences, and we want studios to open up about their productions, but when they're greeted by hatred like this, I see why they wouldn't want to. 
And right now, the overall community for Jujutsu Kaisen is nothing like that. It's full of amazing and inclusive fans that just want to share their love for the show. And heck, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be making this video right now. But their positivity is just so infectious. All you have to do is take one look at the Sakuga animators work for the series to see that there's something incredible going on here. Studio Mappa is bringing Akutami-san's art to life in what he's like, I would have never imagined. Jujutsu Kaisen is truly a great work of art that is trying to move the genre of shonen manga and anime forward along with many of its other contemporaries. There's obviously a lot of darkness in the world. There's no getting around it, but if we can protect the things and people we love, then maybe, just maybe, we can make the world a better place by helping others. Hey everyone, it's Daniel here. Thank you so much for watching this video. Uh, I worked incredibly hard on this, the writing process, the editing process, and from the bottom of my heart, thank you for watching this. I just wanted to take some time to gush about a show that I am absolutely in love with right now, that being Jujutsu Kaisen, and I just wanted to share this with you all and share some positivity, because I feel like we need more of that in the anime community in general and as a whole. Uh, this transition to this form of content has been scary, but it's been some of the most fulfilling work I've ever done on YouTube. So thank you all for watching and giving me the opportunity to do this. If you wanna support me, obviously liking, subscribing, and sharing this video really does mean a lot. If you wanna go above and beyond and support me financially and monetarily, because oftentimes these videos are demonetized because of BS copyright issues, feel free to go over to my coffee page at coffee.com forward slash Geekspeak Nation, which will be in the description and the pinned comment down below. And also you can follow me on Twitch where I'm out there playing some video games with you guys and having a good time. And also make sure you follow me on Twitter. That's normally where I'm tweeting out updates and keeping you guys abreast and alert of what is happening with the channel and um, normally what I'm working on next. But with that being said, guys, thank you so much for watching. I'm Daniel, and don't forget to get geeky.